Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant. Here is a compilation of one of the ongoing plot lines of my fan fictions that are used to explore and demonstrate the setting of Warhammer 40k, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. Many an entry is the result of a vote, as I will leave them on a cliffhanger and then get the gentle listeners to forge the narrative by voting in the comments so they can control the direction and events of the story. So if you enjoy any of these stories, then do watch the weekly entries on the guides and prepare to exert your own influence and vote on the storylines. Now, I very much hope you enjoy the following compilation, a lead up to my campaign at Abundance Tertius. Empress Throne. I thought I was getting an easy ride when we received our new posting. Rotated from the front to defend triage, protect the forward medical camp, usually a cakewalk. But do not think me a coward. I don't deserve that. I have been fighting for months against things you would never even believe existed. It's one thing to see the vids, the posters, to believe the recruitment officers. Living it is different. Our lines have been smashed by the filth. What was once a stationing miles behind lines was now the last inch in our defences in this sector. The Xenos had come at us in their droves, their oceans. Their weapons were crude, but it did not matter. Their numbers were inexhaustible. They crashed against our lines across the entire sector. At first, we thought it was just a barbaric charge. Xenos are animals. But it was not. They were probing us, testing us, working out the exact damage we could inflict on them, where, when and how. We treated it like a game then, counting numbers we had shot down and marked notches on our guns or helmets. We laughed and even called shots as challenges to each other then. Headshots only, gut shots only. We were so... smug. Pride goeth before the fall, as they say. How things fell so quickly. From shooting fish in a barrel, we went to manically trying to keep them back. I watched as they simply rolled over Hill 435. It had everything a guardsman could wish for in her defence. Razor wire, heavy weapon emplacements, ammunition like a bottomless well. We thought it impregnable. To be honest, I thought it was over the top. Holy throne, how I was a fool then. We all were. It took less than an hour to approach and then simply swarm the hill. No matter what we threw at them, they kept on coming. As they crested the hill, I realised how we had underestimated them. So many. Their primitive projectile weapons I thought were almost pointless. But then the sky darkened. We were watching the hill. We didn't take cover, not one of us. Then they struck. Shafts of wood with metal heads. So primitive, yet when they hit in such numbers, we were decimated. So many dead in that first volley. Pierced multiple times by those simple shafts of wood, but no less lethal for being so simple. Entire ranks of us went down. We scattered into the trenches. We hid from the rain of wood and metal, but that was their goal. The rain from behind the hill made us hide while their horde ate the distance between the hill and our lines. They were on us in what felt like seconds, among us, killing us. I never thought my bayonet drill would ever be used, but it saved me time and time again. I lunged and pulled back, lunged and pulled back. Blood and viscera, their bodies and ours covering the ground, making it slippery, making it hell. And that was the first day the first of many, many days. Months. No matter how many of them we kill, they keep coming. Don't know. I sort of respect them. We must seem like the scum here. We're invading their world. They were here first. But why doesn't matter anymore. It's us or them. 
and at the moment, it seems like it's going to be them. Behind this last line, our last in this sector, stands the forward medical building. Inside are every wounded soldier from this entire front. Thousands. If, when, they cross this last line, they will be in there. I did to think. But I know what will happen. They will crash through the doors, will stream into every corridor, every ward, every bay. None will be spared. Imagine that. Lying in your bed, unable to move, unable to defend yourself, while these horrors rush in and kill everyone before you, knowing they will end you too. I think I am lucky. At least I will look into their eyes and it will be swift when it happens. At least I can go down fighting. It begins. Our artillery opens up from miles behind the lines. They bombard the valley. But they are fools. They should be packing up and moving. I don't know where, but they should be running. The Xenos are coming. The next half hour is like an eternity or a second. Time has no meaning in the fray. I ignore the rain from the sky, the wooden rain of death. I don't care. I stand, firing furiously, firing continuously. The repetitive action a mark of my training, not my control. I fire and fire, reload and fire again. I go through energy pack after energy pack. But it is not enough. Not nearly enough. So many of them. So few of us. I reach down to my belt. But there is nothing there. I am out. My lasgan now, nothing more than a club. I look up and down the line. So many dead. Hunched or sprawled, littering the trench like broken dolls. My friends, my company. Gone. All these shafts of wood jutting out of them. The horde charges forever forward. I have a minute, maybe. The noise of them is deafening. The shock of seeing I am nearly the last of my entire company still breathing. My ears deceived me. I drop my last spent cartridge and then fix bayonet. I will take one of them with me. Just one. Like a heroic vid, my rebelling mind has music playing. Voices like a choir exalting the Emperor. Ha! <laughs> well, at least I lasted until my death to go mad. I stand and prepare for death. I see a last wave of projectiles fill the skies and I drop my lasgun and open my arms as I slump to my knees. I prepare for it. I close my eyes. The music. The holy music gets louder, deafening almost, as I prepare to join the Emperor. Perhaps he welcomes me. A shadow passes over me. I hear the ricochet of metal on metal. Wooden shafts clatter to the ground around me. I open my eyes, and then I see her. Towering over me in black armor, power armor. She stood between me and death. I am alive because of her. The singing is not a dream. I snap a look from side to side and my jaw drops. Lines of them. The wood bouncing off their armour. In their hands the weapons of the Emperor himself. The Holy Bolter. They walk forward. They are not stopping at the trench. They are advancing into the horde. The guns shoot out and Xenos die in their droves. Exploding like the Emperor himself is obliterating them. She stops firing as two of her sisters pass us. She takes off her helmet, just to speak to me. I can barely hear her over the artillery, the bolters screaming, the song of battle and praise of the Emperor that is issuing from these dark-clad women all around me. She looks down and smiles. She nods towards the hospital. I look at it while she kneels down and whispers in my ear. This will not happen unless all of us are one. He will not answer unless it is all of us. Say the words. I look. I do not understand. I see the building is dark, but there is activity inside. Singing. A beautiful song, but terrible also. An exultation to the Emperor. She whispers again. Son of the Emperor. Warrior of humanity. You know the words. Say them now. I know. They come to me. The Emperor protects. No warrior of light. Not with your mouth. Not with your lips. 
Say them with your heart. Say them with your soul. Bring his power. I look down and nearly weep so much is happening. So much is going on. But then I look up again. I look at the triage and think it harder than I have ever thought it before. As instructed, I say it with my heart. But even so, it cannot be contained. It sallies out of my mouth as a bellow. The Emperor protects! And then I see a miracle. A miracle. As if I caused it, but it cannot be me. Light blazes from every last window in the triage. It is like a bomb has gone off inside. I hear it building, what I think is a huge screaming at first. But then, as the doors open, I hear it clearer. As my injured brothers and sisters pour out of every door, every window, they charge. It is a bellow, not a scream. They are armed with las guns that seem to be glittering with light. All of them, thousands of them, flooding out like a tidal wave to meet the Xenos. As they pass me, I am a gog. Men I knew to be crippled. Women I knew to be maimed. They all charge us, one, healed. The sister firmly puts her arm under mine and lifts me up. She passes me an energy pack for my las gun. She smiles at me while putting her helmet back on, then nods in the direction of the Xenos, the direction her sisters are leading the army I thought destroyed. Come, warrior of light, let us not be left out. Come, let us smite the unclean for the emperor. I snatch the energy pack and slam it home. I check my bayonet is fixed properly. Then I look back at her and I grin for the Emperor. Then we charge. The days have blown by since I stood on the trenches, leaving myself open for a hail of death I knew I could not stop. Since I was saved by the Emperor's own angels. Not his angels of death, not his Astartes, but the next best thing, his holy sisters. She had stood over me, shielded me with her own body, put my life before hers and suffered the arrows on my behalf. She saved me, but not just my body. She saved my very soul, for I had lost my faith, and she gave it back to me with a vengeance. Vengeance, an appropriate word, for that is exactly what we took from the enemy from that day onwards. It turned out these things were not Xenos after all, but worse. They were debased and corrupted humans, filthy mutants, with what I now knew as wooden arrows and their packs like animals. At first, we had underestimated them. But then they pushed us back again and again, nearly wiped us out. But the sisters arrived, in their black power armour, with a holy bolter, flamer and faith alone, they led us back into the fight. Miracles were common now, things to be looked forward to, not just prayed for, and we saw so many. It turned out that this was once a human world, in the dark age of technology, 20,000 years ago or something. It was the centre of a star empire then. <laughs> or some snot told me it overheard while acting as a Sherpa for the tech boys. Or was it some academic of some form? I forget. But it panned out. For with the sisters in charge, leading the way, burning the enemies as they did, we moved like lightning across every continent of this whole world. We pushed the things back and took their places of power from them. Not only had they changed due to chemicals and age and war, but also due to being heretics. 
they had to be put to the sword, one and all. And with the sisters there, we went at it like hammer and tongs. It was as if the sisters' mere presence made us all froth at the mouth. We had such a fire in our belly. We were doing this for the emperor. We could tell he was happy about it. Lights and birds and flames and flying priests are plenty. It was like being in the great crusade, some said. Like he was with us every step of the way. When we started bumping into things that were the size of land raiders, horns and screams and blue flames, he was with us. He shielded us from the flames whenever a sister led us in. He crushed them with his holy light when a sister pleaded for it. And he had empowered us, all of us, even me. I felt ecstasy when I witnessed the mass firing of the sisters' bolters. Their massive organ guns atop transports, firing a missile at the enemy for every key struck, every cord rung. We burned them and slew them wherever we found them. And we made for their capital. A month ago, I would not have thought that these things were human, let alone base horrors of ones. But I certainly would not have thought that they were organised, or had a capital, a seat of power. But they did. And we crushed all around it before heading directly at that place. Usually, war dictates that we crush the capital, cut off the head first, then resistance usually crumbles. It's what we did in the last two worlds. But here, nah. We were not here to demoralise them. We were here to wipe them out. So if their capital until last. And the sisters shelled it remorselessly for days all the while walking our lines and leading us in prayers, in psalms, in song, in glory to the emperor. None slept, none of them faltered, none of them seemed to stop for basic sustenance. They didn't need to. Their faith fed them, their faith kept them strong, kept them awake and kept them pure. We loved them for it. Knowing that it was truly the love of the emperor we felt really, but one can't help but thank the one who brings you the sustaining meal sometimes, despite that that thanks should be for the cook. <laughs> Am I right? Anyways, the last battle was bloody, as bloody as any bayonet work I've ever done. You may scoff, but most times you don't actually get to use them. If your guns don't take down a Xenos, nine times out of ten, a bayonet ain't gonna either. So if they hit your lines, it's over but this time was different. We had the sisters with us. We had squads of them leading our companies in. I was in a mix and match outfit, of course, nothing left of my original. But with them at the front, leading us on, inspiring us all, protecting us all. When the guns and missiles of the sisters went silent, we didn't hang about. It was double time over the defile, then straight into them. The sisters were things of wonder, I even had the fortune of my very own angel being in the squad that led us in. But it was hard fighting, corridor fighting. The sisters could not be stopped. Their flamers and bolters tore the monsters to pieces. Me and the lads covering the side aisles had plenty to be doing as well. Previously, I'd have called this hell. Cold, dark, noise rebounding all around and deafening us all. The chaos of it. But now... I felt righteous. I was doing the Emperor's will. I was as close to heaven as I could get. As close, perhaps, as when I will sit at his very side. I was doing his work. We shot and burnt and bludgeoned and bayoneted our way down miles of corridors filled with these things. But this was it. This was the last of them. So every stab, slash or shot was just one more step towards their end. Their final destruction. We sang. We actually sang while we did it. But I won't try to replicate that now. No guns to drown me out. I sound like a grox that's been kicked in the privates. We all did. But the sweet song of the sisters, the bass of their bolters, the swing of their chainswords, it made it holy. They'd done it. We had done it. The vile things inside gave up practically no resistance. For the level of defence it had, and the fanaticism from its followers. Odd. 
When the canoness walked into its chamber, we watched as she did not stop, did not falter, did not slow. She just strode towards a husk on her throne, and as soon as she was in range, she pulled the trigger on her plasma pistol. And it died. The sting that its followers prayed to, lived for, died for. It just shone like a star as the plasma smashed into its face and melted it off in a nanosecond. And it was over. The things just all slumped down, as if whatever had made them move was suddenly gone. They just stopped. So we walked amongst them and finished their miserable existences. Hours later, I was one of those tasked with checking. A grisly business usually, but I felt so calm. So at peace. We've done it. The Emperor had given us an enemy, and we had taken its head. Well, the sisters had, but I had been allowed to help. I was proud. And so I took that calm and energy, and went out with the search parties to check the battlefield. On the approach was where they had fought hardest, for some reason. The tunnels were bad, but it was more like they were so desperate that they were just throwing themselves at us to try and to drown us in their bodies. But down here, we had to fight hardest. I won't lie, I found him in the most sad way. It was getting dark. I had walked for so long, I had lost track, I had lost concentration. I was reliving the day, the way my angel moved, the way she slew those heathens. Everything about her. So I lost myself, and nearly missed him. I'm not proud to say that I stepped on his hand, but the effect was good, I guess. Because he moved it, and gave off a groan. I slipped in shock and landed in the mud and blood beside him. Half hidden under bodies, he was barely alive. As I pulled those piles off him, he gasped for air. He looked up at me after a few seconds. The last body gone, I looked at him too. Blood caked around his mouth, his chest half crushed still. I could see the pain in his eyes as he smiled and whispered, Smile for me. For some reason, I didn't just smile. I beamed at him. I turned him over and gave him a gulp of water. He took it and looked up at me. What's your name, soldier? says I. And he whispered back, Josiah, but you can call me Joss. Once, he was a proud and holy man of the church, lauded and applauded wherever he went. But this was before his fall, his failure. He had fought on the front lines for three decades or more, forever buoying up the faith of all who surrounded him. His sermons were a thing of power and purpose and filled all around him with righteous zeal. But that was before his encounter with chaos. On the day, he saw the skies turn to fire, the land royal and quiver, the very air he breathed was acrid and thick. And on that day, when the Lord of Change erupted into reality, when its birthing screech pierced the heavens and made his mind collapse, on that day, he succumbed to the most human of all emotions, the most simple of drives, fear and survival. He turned tail and fled, desolate and confused, terrified. But he was found later, his ignominy known, his reputation forever shattered. He wept uncontrollably. He shuddered like a doe in the teeth of a wolf. He was temporarily broken. And that was then, and this was now. Now he stood in a huge room made from black marble, from its floor to its highest rafters. Darkly foreboding, he felt so small as he looked up at her. A canoness of the Holy Order of our martyred lady, his friend, his doom. He was brought forward harshly by the two sororitas at his sides, as if he would run now. Where could he go, even if he wished to? 
The canoness looked down as he stopped. Without pause for the moment, she proceeded, the bile dripping off every word she intoned. The accusations have been read. The evidence has been heard. Your deceit and cowardice attested without a shadow of a doubt. You are guilty. Have you any last words before I pass judgment? He knew it would avail him naught, and contrary to his will, his mouth opened and he began. Long have I served the Emperor all my life. I have faced those things few others could. I have striven mightily in the name of the Emperor. You of all people know this, my past, my deeds. I had one moment of weakness, one instant of doubt. Does the one act wash away all that I have done in his name? Does it count for naught? I am but a man. A man? Alas, no longer. For you are now less than nothing. You are a traitor, and your defence is the greatest of shames, the most overwhelming of evidence, the most cardinal of sins. You convict yourself further by its utterance. Some who come before me, I am almost tempted to indulge in that greatest of all weaknesses. Clemency. But not for thee. For we were both at the Scholar Proginium. We rose together, and thus do you admit that you were once a shepherd of humanity. A lord of the Emperor's Light. A prince of the Church. So you who knew of the Emperor's light, knew of his virtue, sung his name in psalm and holy song, you turned your back on his light. You who knew him best, loved him least, you betrayed him. Thus you are the basest of things, most wretched of all. For you knew and still turned from him. I am ashamed to know you. I am ashamed that you still draw the same breath as me. I am ashamed that you still live. Thus do I pass judgment. The words seemed to echo back at him, and he saw the sneer on her face that they elicited. Never before had he seen her face take on such a countenance when addressing him. It stung as much as her words, the hate and loathing in her eyes. With each word his head lowered, his shoulders sagged further. He was broken. You will be taken from this place and interred in an engine of penance, so you can still serve as an example. An example of what happens to the abhorrent, to those who indulge in the sin of weakness. You will end your days in pain and suffering, and the knowledge that you will never be accepted into the light of the Emperor upon your final death. For even the God Emperor of mankind will take no pity on your soul. He was then led away, as she nonchalantly just waved her hand, as if dismissing something beneath her condition. Tempt. The canoness stepped down the many stairs from her elevated position of authority. Upon reaching the black marble floor, she was immediately flanked by her two ceremonial guards, despite her being more able than any other to defend herself. She sighed deeply as the events of the day were sorted, compartmentalized, and then ostensibly forgotten. She would need her head to be clear for the days and weeks ahead. The transports had arrived, and her order were now ready for embarkation. As she approached the door to her inner sanctum, she turned and nodded to her guards. Only one was necessary at her door. The other could make the final call go out. Tell the sisterhood, all of the order of the martyred lady that reside here, Tell them to make haste to the spaceport as previously instructed. The guard nodded, 
but then turned, the words not quite sinking in until that point. She looked at the canoness for confirmation. Yes, all. Even the garrison. Now go. As her sister marched down the halls to carry out her orders, there seemed to be a spring in her step, a buzzing in her more hurried stride. It had been many centuries since the entire force had been fielded. Everyone knew that this order, this level of response, could only mean a battle of legendary importance and scope. The canoness walked inside her sanctum and allowed the door to close before she exhaled long and hard and leaned against the door and whispered to herself. For where we go, we will need every last sister, every last sinew, every last ounce of faith. For we go to Abundance Tertius. Lord Emperor, have mercy on our souls. The Crimson Fists had held, as they always did. This was, after all, their preferred enemy, and they knew them well. The only thing they did not know were the numbers involved, swathes of them, more than had been anticipated. The Greenskins had come out of the forest and darklands of this world, the very edges of its realms, where nobody watched, nobody catalogued. None had seen their numbers swell over the years since the last purge. They had been so quiet. But they had burst from the darkness in numbers none could predict. The Crimson Fist had set up their defenses on the hive directly in the path of the war. As primitive as they were, their numbers and enthusiasm made up for any technological or skill deficit. They crashed against the walls time and again, but were always forced back. Always the disciplined volleys of the Fist found their unerring target and reaped such a toll from the orcs that they ended each day only slightly ahead of where they had been at the onset of the day. But all those tiny gains were adding up. All of those inches became feet, became miles. The horde had smashed its way to the final walls, the inner circle, and ammunition was running low, as was morale. At the dawn of the twelfth day, the defenders of the city, the Crimson Fists, found a score of blips appearing in their skies. Their auspex word. Captain Cesare waited stoically for the identification to be revealed. His lieutenant looked up from his screen and just beamed at him. Well, what do you see? Who are they? The lieutenant, Lucullus, could not help but laugh as he responded. <laughs> A full score of storm ravens and other assorted transports, my lord. They wear the black and white. Our brothers have come. Ah. And we have two drop pods incoming to our position, sir. The two stood and walked outside as the drop pods slammed into the main plaza, their doors bursting off. Inside were very well strapped and protected containers. As the closest marines were waved into action by Lucullus, the contents became immediately obvious. It was filled to the rafters with ammunition and heavy bolters. The other was filled with longer boxes, each containing a very much needed resource. One of the marines marched towards Captain Cesare and his flanking lieutenant, but got to arm's reach and simply thrust out a scrawled note on a picked reviewer. The contents were simple. Prepare to sally. B. T. As the sun rose, the sounds of the orc assault picked up momentum again, the rising scream of their war cry raging at the walls and hard points. Yet today was different. Very. As the Greenskins rushed headlong at the breaches yet again, this time they were met with ranked fire of heavy bolters. Those firing with bolters alone were doing so with abandon, but still precision. With ammo no longer an issue, it became a field day. But the morning was to then see another change, as the dull background of the Orc war cry began to be drowned on either side of the hive. The officers of the Crimson Fists looked down to either side, like the horns of a bull. They heard more and more chainsaws. The Black Templars, in full array of Crusader squads, and supported by Crusader Land Raider fire, were sweeping around the sides of the hive, killing all in front of them. With a look of satisfaction, Captain Cesare massed in half of his men in the plaza, then opened the doors. 
as the greenskins saw that they would pour into the square. The bellow of the crimson fist thundered at them like a banshee's wail, and as one, the fists all charged. Chainswords wielded by black and white clad marines on either side, by blue clad marines with red fists in the center, the assault craft strafing any you trying to withdraw from the trap. The orcs died in their droves, the chainsaws biting into their flesh from the merest contact, pulling themselves into the orcs, then while discharging rivers of green blood and viscera from their guards, like green handheld muck spreaders. The ground was literally drowned in the blood of the Xenos. By sunset, the deed had been done. None had been suffered to live. As the star finally dipped below the horizon, the leader of the Black Templars picked his way through mounds of dead greenskins to find his opposite numbers. He approached Captain Cesare by the light of the moon and blurted out his best greeting. The Crimson Fists were sons of dawn, after all, but they were far more polite. You are Captain Cesare Borgia? Yes. Many thanks for the incredibly well-timed support, Brother Templar. We are pleased to shed the blood of the enemies of the Imperium alongside the Crimson Fists. But, now that this fray is over, we are here to collect you. We are all to go to a serious posting. I have orders here. We are to make all haste to the Abundance System. Abundance Tertius, to be precise. You only need to know three things about me. But the only important one is probably the last of the three. 1. I am the leader of this population, this world. 2. I am called the Archduke Somnambulus. And 3. I do not sleep anymore. I cannot remember the last time I slept for more than half an hour, and that was snatched in a meeting. We were droning on and on interminably. Sandbags of all things. These poor fools think that sandbags will help. They have no idea. I dare not tell them. If I did, then they would all just roll over and die. Would go limp with disbelief. Or tear their hair out and scratch their own faces off in the despair of it all. I know. Holy throne, I know. I have been visited by it every night, every day, for over a fortnight now. Why won't it just end it, please? I tried to sleep during the day, but that became a death sentence to anyone in my presence. I can barely hear what people are saying anymore. I look at them through glazed eyes and attempt to keep my countenance steady, my bearing regal. They must never know. It is well that the vast majority of the time, all I am asked for is my assent, my blessing. Their lips move, they pass me papers while doing this. They indicate where I should sign if I am in agreement. This only happens if it is important, of course. The vast majority of the things they consult me on, I just nod, and it is made so. I am, after all, the governor of this world. I hold the power of rule, passed down to my family since the times of the Great Crusade, from our God King, the Emperor of Mankind himself. I represent his will and his purity and wisdom on this planet, this Tremlin Five. But he does not save me, he does not help me. Long have I prayed for his rescue from this plight but to no avail. When it hangs above me, staring at me through the night, I sometimes feel the Emperor does not really exist. This thing warps my mind with the fatigue it enforces. The first time I saw it, there, above me, simply hanging from the ceiling, 
I called for my guards in a panic. I have never done this again. It dropped down and slaughtered them as they came through the door. One after another, without pause, restraint, without clemency. It beheaded, gutted, strangled and sliced its way through two score of my men before it left. But it returned the night after. Despite me being in a different palace, despite me being in a different city, it was there. But this time I did not call for help. I did not see the point. I glared at it myself and even tried to raise a las gun toward it. But no, it was too fast. It was on the floor next to my bed before my eye could catch the movement. It broke my hand and arm in a thousand places, taking the las pistol off me with ease. I barely resisted screaming. It was one of the bravest things I had done in all of my long and privileged life. But I ate the pain. If I had cried out, there would only have been a repeat performance of the night before. And I loved these men and women in this city. Where I grew up, where I was crowned. I would not call them in to be slaughtered so. It left at first light. I called for assistance when it had been gone for over a quarter of an hour. The longest of my life, I had thought then. But called for assistance, I did. I explained that I had slipped badly, and then must have twisted it in the night. My arm, of course. The apothecary did not believe me, really. But he performed as intended. He had heard of the thing that haunted me. His eyes were like a shark's when he nodded and diagnosed pain relief and an augmetic brace to repair the wound. I took my pain relief sparingly the day after, for it made me drowsy. I was at home in the broad daylight when I took too much on that day and dozed off. My people let me, those kind and darling fools. But I was taught my lesson. When I awoke out of my sedation, it was to a room bathed in blood, festooned with the parts of my attendants and closest manservants. I wept for hours before calling to inform the military of my situation. It was dealt with calmly but swiftly. They suggested I move continent, be placed in a bunker, or be sent off planet. If I moved, what would it do? commit a rampage across our world until it found me again. If I slunk into a bunker, would it not find me, and then not only slaughter the men and women around me, but then exact revenge as punitively and painfully as before? If I left the planet, would it not just move its attentions to others who take on the responsibility of my position, my person? I cannot let that happen. I will not execute my people so. Thus I shake with the levels of stimulants my system and dread those hours of night, for I go to my chambers and am assisted to change, and then I get into my bed and wait, staring at the ceiling, pretending I will sleep so my attendants leave, but I do not, as it makes just enough noise to let me know it has arrived. I stare up at it all night. If my eyes close, it lets saliva drop onto my hands or feet or chest. Anywhere I can cover, but always it is painful. Not only the touch of its spittle, but it has a stinging, burning effect. So I lay there each night staring at it, going slowly insane passing my days looking at all around me in wonder that they have not yet given up, but witness their morale drop day by day by day as they watch me become a ghost. They know it really. They all know. They can see it in my eyes. We are all going to be eaten by the Tyranids. I know we are. I look at the evidence every night. But they... They can see it in my eyes. 
I just want it all to be over. When will it be over? Please, tonight, let it kill me. Location Abundance Tertius Archduke Somnambulus I sit, my eyes barely able to focus. I am told help has arrived, but I cannot really understand. Everything is a blur, a grey and nightmarish blur. Men walk in to my audience chamber, ruffians, the most ragamuffin to ever enter my presence. But they look hard, everything about them, their garb, their scars, their red bandanas, their tattoos, all scream of war. My men move to close around me, but I wave them away. What could possibly threaten me now? I have not slept. I cannot sleep. A thing visits me every night, a tyrannid thing. So many of my men it has killed. It watches me at night. Its saliva burns me if I drop off. It watches me. One of the men starts to talk and just stops. He takes a few steps toward me. My men flinch again, but my lack of movement persuades them I am in no danger. They do not know it is because I simply do not care anymore. With this man to take out that lethal-looking knife at his side and thrust it into me, I would thank him. He half crouches and looks me in the eye. He then nods at me. He comes closer. So close. He even sniffs me like some form of hunting dog. He sniffs at me. He snaps back and honestly looks like he understands. But he cannot. He looks at his men one after the other and makes hand just as I do not know. They look at me and scowl. They detest me, it seems. All turn on their heel and march out, taking my head of security in tow. The day passes. Another grey and empty day of meetings that I do not participate in. I just sit where they indicate. I do not even recognise them anymore. It has been weeks since I slept. Weeks. I know I am going mad as I try to focus on their faces and all I see is the visage of my nightly visitor. It makes their words even more difficult to understand with a dozen leering Xenos faces blankly eyeing me. I do not react. I have not the energy. My fire gutters out. Night comes. <sighs> as always, I am undressed by my body servants. I smile at them wanly and dismiss them. I trudge to my bed. The ritual complete. It will be here soon. The windows slowly part and creak as they open. It is here. It scuttles to the ceiling, taking its place above me, staring at me, as it has done for weeks now. I look up at it, preparing for our nightly duel. Can I meet its eyes all night? Or will I doze off and be awoken by a stinging spittle that it would dribble onto my arms to shock me back into consciousness? It is then that the doors burst open. I close my eyes. I know what will happen. It will kill all of my guard again, as it has done twice. But this time it is different. Very Shouts in a dialect I do not recognise burst from the lungs of the men who are making it through the doorway, the beast on the ceiling still. They're so fast. 
two men rolling into the room and two standing at the doorway firing their las guns up at it. The lictor. The horror leaps down to engage them. I prepare to be covered in human blood and viscera again. It will kill them with ease, as it did two score of my own men when this all started. One of the men who rolled in comes up with a net of all things, the other a huge knife like their colonel's. Why, it is their colonel. He is with his men. So similar are they. What I next see is a thing of wonder. Holy Emperor, I have never seen men move so fast. I have seen pigs of marines do so, but not normal men. The ones at the door were firing to its sides, forcing it into a predetermined zone, it seems. The net flies up as the beast falls down. I see the beast tear it apart in mid-flight. The fools. But then, as it lands, the split second it took to perform this deed left it wide open, its clawed hands pulling the net in twain. The two men below are inside its garden, stabbing, stabbing and stabbing as they push it back into a wall. They continue as its limbs thrash, but they are perfectly positioned to be safe from it. I do not know how, but they seem to know what it was and how to kill it. As it slows and then stops flailing, the two men are still stabbing it in its torso and now its face. They pull it down and continue for what seems like minutes, their blades rising and falling, rising and falling, covered in the viscous goo from the monster. I'm stunned. The next moments are macabre, as they collect every last drop of its blood meticulously. I vaguely remember asking what they do. I must be wrong. I must be misremembering due to my fatigue. I swear one told me that they would wear it, would cover themselves in the blood of their thing so they could get close to the nest, a nest where others may be. I am mad, I must be. Nobody would do that. The colonel talks to me, but my eyes are on the nightmare. It is dead. I cannot hear what he says. I close my eyes. I wake from my slumber. My body servants dress me, beaming at me all the way. I am told I have slept for three days solid. My mind is not yet fresh, but my body actually obeys my commands. I can walk with purpose again. I can stand tall again. I, I am hungry. Ravenous. I eat like a gutter rat who has snuck into a banquet before it has started. My face strips were fat and the juices of fruit and wine. Instead of being repulsed, my men, they beam at me. They bring me more. I gorge. I am told my itinerary has, has but one activity on it for the entire cycle. It is tonight, after I have rested more. My day is filled with music, with meals, with sitting in the sun. I doze off many a time, but with relaxation. I dream. They are filled with an angry shadow, but it is nothing. That beast cannot harm me any more. Not with these Katachan warriors here. I am safe, true, but my people are so. I do not know how, but I think I recall one of those rough men telling me about the fleet, a glorious navy being dispatched, that it was a small tendril fleet of Tyranids, and that our most illustrious admiral, the one they dubbed the Border Prince, has stopped them in their tracks and smashed them. I cannot remember the specifics, but I know the threat is over. Thank the throne. My people are safe. My people will live. The night descends, but it holds no terror for me now. I laugh at the moon as I look at her and rise to prepare to meet the brave men and women who have cleansed the Xenos scum from our world. My home. My love. Abundance Tertius.
I walk into my audience chamber and, and am met by the sight of those glorious ruffians, who at this present moment I could hug one and all. But they are not just grim in their bearing, they are grim in their countenance. I can feel their tension. Or is it excitement? I usually know, but cannot discern it this time. Perhaps it is a blend of the two. I take my place at the head of the table, and we all sit, them and mine. My warriors not seeming to be of the same race to these hard-bitten veterans who sit alternately in each seat with mine as they look at me. My mind still reels from the events of the last weeks. These men are rough indeed. Their scars and red bandanas with an acrid fog coming off them from where they douse themselves in the blood of my tormentor. All the better to hunt the secret lair of its kind and purge all within. I hope you have slept, practically shouts the colonel in charge of the delegation. It pains my ears. I feel no animosity. These heroes could yell at me all day, and I would still smile at them. My people are saved. He seems so much like a rancor. No real insignia of any import on him, no decorum in him. But I wait. I have three pieces of information for you. I feel you may not have been able to absorb them when last we spoke before you reclined. He is right, of course. I have no recollection at all. Not even the smell. Holy throne. I must have been near death or madness from the exhaustion. He continues. One. We have cleared out the bugs and the navy has crushed the tendril on its way here. I raise my glass and salute him and his dishevelled but gallant men with my best wine. They ignore me. <sighs> no decorum at all. What place is etiquette on a battlefield? I will not change anything about them. He continues. Two. The real reason we are here is because you have a rock coming in your direction. The gasps around the table are verging on whales. I put down my glass and take in a deep breath. No. No, it isn't fair. From the frying pan to the fire, it isn't fair. I compose myself before I slowly retort, although it comes out more like an Im I am imploring. Pathetic. After everything... I near unman myself before my people. I if abundance should fall, a score of worlds, hive worlds we feed, will die of starvation. As the murmuring amongst my people rises, I understand their fears. A rock. An orc ship. It will contain millions of green skins. Possibly a fate worse than the bugs. I feel the walls closing in on me. But stop. Something is happening. As one of my aides begins to openly wail, a Katshan brings his hands over his head and behind his back languidly, then extends a right hook and the wailing ends as my man's head snaps to the side and he slumps to the table unconscious. Nicely done, if you ask me. Wailing. Ah, <sighs> the dishonor. But the Katshan's smiling. The colonel has a twinkle in his eye as he passes me two seals and says... Here is a response from the Imperium. As you say, Archduke. Twenty hive worlds rely on abundance tertius to feed them. I look at them. The seals. And my eyes flash as I stand. I smile warmly at the Colonel. He grins back at me and merely says, Sweet dreams, Archduke. As he stands. And with his men. He walks out boldly. And oh, they will be. I will sleep like a baby tonight. For I do not fear. For the first seal. Ha! It is a single emblem. A personal crescent. I know it. We all do in this sector. Major General Killian. The scourge of the Xenos. Never defeated, never forced to retreat, never having given a single inch of ground to any of a thousand Xenos enemies he has matched his forces against, known across the entire sector simply as Major Kill. But not only that. His sign would have been enough. But 
stairs. We will be safe, for it is a regimental sigil known across the entire Imperium. We will be safe. I laughed myself to sleep that night, holding both the sigil of Major General Killian in my right hand, but in my left. He was odd. I didn't notice it for ages. Not really. But now I'm starting to think that I am the only one, the only person who sees him for what he is. Whatever he is, wherever he comes from, he isn't like the rest of us. At first I thought he was shy. You get so many of them out here, orderlies, unimportant, generally ignored and abused. The only time we really exist is when something has gone wrong. When someone has to take the blame. So you get plenty of them. The shy ones. Beaten down, tired out, head down, slouching through their existence. With the only hope being a miracle. The miracle of something. Anything. Changing. But it never does. I used to have such dreams as well, once upon a time. Not now. Like my physique and my appetite for marine fiction, it has dwindled over the years. It's the soul-crushing boredom of it all. But nor would anyone wish for excitement. In the Imperium, that can only mean one thing. An invasion. And that never ends well. Not for us. Not for them. We rarely lose. But it's bad when we do. High stakes as always. So the job we do here, simple relay station that it is, is still intensely important. The Imperium is huge. The coordination of its many resources are an art as much as a process or procedure. The wheels turn slowly the majority of the time. But when slicked with the correct lubricants, the right buttons are in danger of being pressed. Then it's actually awe-inspiring to witness what we can do how much we can gather in such a short period of time. We had been monitoring Abundance Tertius for a good few rotations now. Most had had only one rotation, but this was my second. It seemed that there were not quite enough engineers of my lowly station to afford me a break. So here I stayed. On the small and rather cramped monitoring satellite station, but our arrays were forever pointed outwards, not down at the planet. For there was to be a battle, a campaign, of such size and scope that it was barely conceivable. So many elements of the Imperium's finest were arriving in the system. Many would take days to get to the main population centers and stations around those worlds from the jump point, but arrive they did. And this listening station was recording all that went on, for certain but also trying to angle its arrays so as to discern movement or activity in the darkness of space between this system and its neighbours. Fleets of ships had already arrived and begun the process of being reassigned to battle groups forming in the segments of the system. The navy was represented in all of its glory. The many ships now preparing to fight for every last inch of space, from escorts and frigates all the way up to cruisers, battleships and grand cruisers. The fleet was well equipped and well led for the coming combat. But there were more forces than just they in the skies above the planets of the system. Multiple battle barges and Astartes manned ships had translated into the system and were massing in different areas, forming the backbone of many a flotilla, but generally separate to the main line squadrons. Monitors were maneuvered into place, missile platforms were dotted around and minefields began to be dropped in areas around celestial bodies. Lines and lines of cargo ships dropping them out sequentially, forming huge nets and lattices that would hopefully snare any assailing fleet elements and punish them. The sensors in our main command room were always cogitating, always recording. Whatever was about to happen in this, the abundant system was going to be huge. So, it was seen as a high-profile placement. 
while also being the most mind-rotting and repetitive tasks possible. Honestly, so often I have thought that this station could be managed by servitors, and none would notice any discernible drop in the quality of the reporting. But here we all are, all dozen of us. I was already tired when this new rotation had arrived. I had already done all of my order finding and internal struggles with the previous rotation. I did not wish to go through it all again, so simply bowed out, so to put it. I just went with the flow. All these bright-eyed menials had been lied to, had been shined up and told that they were doing fundamental work for the war effort. The shine would last about a month. The ardour, the rigour. But after that point, it would soon devolve to lowest minimum effort reporting and analysis due to simple fatigue. There was so much information being collected, but it almost was bled of its meaning. When you see numbers on a screen again and again, eventually, the numbers are their own entity and no longer matter in what they are meant to represent, what they are meant to describe. So all of the mindless patriotism in the world will not protect you from the realisation that it would not matter who collected the information, who did your tasks, as long as they were done. It's hard not to become jaded when you realise how utterly pointless your activity is as well. For if the build-up led to a victory, all that would be remembered was the name of the captains, the ships involved, the planets saved or smashed. And if the fleet lost, then the entire sector would be overrun and this station, along with all of the meticulously collected data, would be either someone's dinner, their plaything, or their enemy. The base and all on it would be destroyed. As soon as this reality struck you, well, all of the potentially reflected glory fell away. It was then that the only thing that really distracted people from the mind-smashing tedium and repetition of their existence was the oldest pastime in the world. Gossip. So everyone would start watching each other, would start cataloguing potential slights, inventing rivalries, imagining cliques, forming cliques as a response, then acting on it all. Everyone would dramatise their existence to evade the simple truth of its utter pointlessness. But not this time. I would stand above. I was definitely going home after this rotation, well away from anyone who would be serving here. I did not wish to make friends in other units. That would then be a constant strain if the conflict here did then end, with mass casualty reports being sent out daily getting up early and making your way to information outlets and looking for other names, other outfits on top of your own. It could be draining. Plus, I simply could not be arsed, if I'm honest. But you can't help yourself. It's the boredom. It's the close quarters you're all shutting together. It's the lack of diversity of tasks. Being able to do it all in your sleep. You end up watching everyone. If you aren't talking, you are listening. If you aren't the one doing, then you are watching. And so, as I was not talking, I soon noticed it. Him. How odd he was. As I said, at first I thought he was just shy, beaten down, or spineless. Many grey people exist out here. No real personality to speak of. But he had none. Zero. That was what was so odd. He literally did not exist. He was a mime, a mimic, a cuckoo in the nest. I was sure of it. He never gave his opinion first, ever. He always backed up whomever was most likely to win, but he always made sure he did not hold the accolade of being the last to comment either. He was never the first to laugh, if he laughed at all. Come to think of it, I cannot remember ever hearing him laugh. But the main point I'm making is that he always, always looked to others' reactions first, like he was perpetually acting at fitting in. He stood after others, moved as they did, shrugged often, and was odd in other ways. I would often catch him just looking at everyone in the mess, like he was about to burst into tears, 
just for a second. His face fell into a picture of utter anguish, as if he were seeing a vision from a nightmare, looking through a window into hell. In those moments, I could say without a nanosecond of hesitation, without one iota of reserve, that he hated being here, hated being amongst us. I cannot say why I have such a strong conviction, but I cannot shake the feeling, the certainty. At first, I felt he might be a mutant or a heretic, but he was as bland as could be. No mutation could be seen. A heretic? Alas, if he was in some fanatical cult, then all of the numbers would not have helped them, unless they were playing on a sector-wide level, which was clearly impossible. Anyone interested in the build-up here could gain much more condensed information elsewhere in the Administratum or Munitorum, so a spy seemed so unlikely. Yet he made my skin crawl after a while. He would then, later, seem to swap shifts or alter patterns so that he was often on shift with me. I thought that when this idea came to me that I was simply delusional due to the drudge. It's what I passed it off as it, when it kept on happening. Because if he were clever and knew, knew that I suspected something, if this was some form of charm offensive, well, he was not equipped for the task in hand, I can tell you. All conversation we had was stilted, economical, blunt and pertaining to work only. Any attempt to make comment about anything else, anyone else, or any situation, was met with a glazed expression and a shrug he had perfected. It said, I don't understand, and I'm not interested in having it explained. So perfectly. But for everyone else, he had this slight bow of the head, a slight raising of the eyebrows at least, an attempt at an apology of sorts, I guess. But with me, it was done that little bit more curtly, more dismissively, with more finality, as he would close his eyes as he turned away and only reopen them again when he was looking directly at his screen again. The most overt, do not speak to me, move I had ever witnessed in my life. The first time it happened, I was shocked. I then learnt to ignore it. Later, I still believed him shy, so let it fly. But now, now it drives me to distraction. I now wait for it to happen, for his incredibly plain and very forgettable face to take on that pinched expression and turn away as if I am some form of nasal and visual insult that he can no longer stomach. But it only seems to be me. I have talked to others. The few I knew would not then see it as an invitation to be chatty in future. None have noticed anything about him at all. To them, Tolman is entirely unobtrusive and devoid of remarkable feature. They barely know he exists. I've waited now. I've watched. I think I know something. You see, Tolman has allowed Roberts and Ronaldo to appear late to their shift for weeks now, and he often turns to me and lets me leave early. The close down of one shift is indeed a one-person job, not two, really. So he's been doing this for me also. I have to admit that any chance to leave his presence early I usually take eagerly. But it's all adding up now. He spends a little too much time on his own with all that data. So the next night comes. The two of us on shift. He on one side of the room, me on the other. He is tapping away at this screen as I am. But when I turn off my headset, I can hear that he is typing just that little bit too fast. His fingers moving that little bit too nimbly. It's odd, like everything about him. But he seems to fidget more tonight. Seems to be more distracted than usual. If distracted is the right word. He seems almost, well, quietly excited about something is the only way I can put it. I have completed my runs of data analysis. I've locked everything down. It is then that he breaks our little pattern, surprising me more than I thought possible. It was so quiet. I was not used to it. So when he spoke, it might as well have been a bellow. I have to visit the ablutions. I will close down tonight as usual. I will be back when you have left. See you tomorrow night. He then stands and walks towards the door and through it. Not even a by your leave. Odd. 
so odd. In fact, it's odd enough for me to think something is going on tonight. Something he definitely wants to be alone in this room to do. So it is very worthwhile to check, I think. What if he was a spy? What if I, a lonely menial, found a spy? Now that, that would be a miracle. Enough of one to change my life. A miracle. So, as I am alone, I creep to the side room and walk inside. A janitorial cupboard where the cleaning products are kept. I squat down in the dark and wait. The door only slightly ajar as I found it. I can see his station in the centre of the room. If he is doing something, I should be able to see it from here. And then he returns. The door sweeps open and he comes in. He then locks the door and closes the viewport. Something is definitely going on. I can feel the excitement drain all of the heat from me. I begin to almost shiver in, in anticipation. Then I realise it is not actually me. It is getting cold in here. My breath now creating plumes of fog and the tiny slither of light that comes from the main room, the door ajar. He is moving from his desk to the centre of the room. It is dark. He has killed most of the other lights. It is only one beam that he now stands in. A dramatic, like a ballet about to begin. And then Tolman bows low, with a grace I did not think possible. It is then that I notice it. The thing that is in front of him. I have to put my hand to my mouth. I bite down on the flesh between my thumb and first finger in an attempt to stop from gasping from losing control, from trying to slam the door and hurl my body against it to keep the thing out. For it is not a who, it is a what, it is a thing. Long, lank, blonde, white hair, angular face and features, but its skin, its skin is pitch black, only barely made out by the swirling pools of light that move on its surface like wards or icons of power that fade and revolve on its skin. Part of it, but not. Its eyes are dark lambent slits, windows into a dark realm of torture and sin. It is a demon of some form, a thing of nightmare. Its ears, pointed like an elder, it is lies enough to be one, yet it is not. It is death. Is this the reason that there is such cold here? The reason my teeth now wish to chatter in my skull, as it just gets worse instead of hitting a plateau. It just seems to get colder as I watch. Tullman rises from his bow, the thing having just walked out of the shadows in front of him. He stands erect and more regally than I have ever seen. His movements have a new silken quality that hypnotizes and besots all at the same time. He is not what he claims to be. I was right. But what is he? He now passes over a, a data crystal of some form, but certainly not of imperial design. The other creature, the dark thing, extends a limb with a hand whose fingers end in dagger-long claws. As it retracts its hand with the crystal, it merely points with its other hand at his, at one of his fingers. Tolman now seems to be staggered, like he's been struck. He takes a pace back and closes his eyes and raises his head to the ceiling and just whispers, At last, I have earned this. Immortality. At last. Tolman then puts his hand onto a panel and takes out a knife. He then cuts off the end of one of his fingers, wraps it in a piece of cloth, and passes it to the now leering dark entity in front of him. A voice as chilling as the air now breezes from the dark but not only from where the being stands, but from all of the angles, all of the shadows and corners, all at once. I nearly jump out of my skin as it seems to be generated right behind me or so. I barely contain myself as it speaks. And my fee. My payment. Talma now looks at it hard for a few seconds, then raises a hand and languidly extends a finger. The finger is pointing directly at me. 
His head finally follows, as he and he twists it so he looks in my direction as well. I can see him, and it is clear that he can see me. His eyes are smiling, his lips twisted in the most cruel and bristling grin I have ever seen. Insane, and yet very sane all at the same time. He is not human at all. I fall backwards trying to avoid the point of his finger, but only strike cleaning equipment and make the clatter in the cupboard that makes any refutation of my presence utterly redundant. I stop dead still. I wait for the footsteps to come. I can only seal Talman now. His dark ally is not in sight. But that is when it happens. It is when it strikes. I feel my back unzip as a blade scores from my tailbone all the way up, up to my shoulder blades. It was so smooth it barely hurt, but the cut makes me fall backwards, all of my tendons slashed as I just flop. I am caught by the entity of pure shadow, engulfed in its arms. I see the huge blade it used to unzip me like a fish. I feel its cold, clammy hands on me, its touch sapping all of the warmth from any area they touch. The strike came from behind me in the dark. It did not move. It simply appeared behind me, as if it were the shadow made manifest, its cold, hate-given form. I cannot resist as it then grins, and just drags me backwards, out of the light, then beyond the dark corners of the room. It drags me into a dark that is not merely an absence of light, introduces me to a cold that is not just a lack of heat. It drags me into its realm to consume me. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. I hope you've enjoyed the story so far and will join us on the weekly entries as a result and will like and subscribe. If you do, then hit the notifications button as I would not want you to miss out. And so, from both myself and Mrs. B, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.